Amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I've got to get through this little introduction here so I can get into the meat of the message. Pray that the Lord will help me to take my time, even though we, know we don't have a ton of time. Well, you all doing okay? Yes, Amen. I know it's tough with the kids and everything, keeping the kids all. Scott's back there. It's like a wrestling match, amen. <laughs> it's all right. That's all right. Praise the Lord. This is a family church. And bring your family. You can be a part of the family if you want to be a part of a family church. A lot of people don't want to be a part of a family church. They want to sit in the back and they just want to come and go as they please. They don't want accountability. You know, when you're a part of a family, there's some accountability like... You know, if you don't do what you should be doing, other people in the family are like, you're not pulling your weight. That's what happens in a family church. There's some accountability. But you know what? Accountability is good. It's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. And we should be accountable to one another and pray for one another and bear one another's burdens. That's all about accountability. We're here for one another. That's a church family. I preach a message this morning from the Bible about the Bible. I preach you a message from the Bible about the Bible. You know the best definer of the Bible is the Bible. The best interpreter of the Bible is the Bible. The best explainer of the Bible is the Bible. You see where we're going with this. The best demonstrator of the Bible There you go, okay. The best justifier of the Bible God doesn't need you to justify the Bible. It justifies itself. The best clarifier of the Bible is, now you're getting it. It's the Bible. So I want to begin by examining just a couple verses here just quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Like I said, I want to get through this. I want to get to the meat of the message. But it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 in the Holy Bible. You know, we preach from the Bible around here. This is a Bible-believing church. We believe the Bible. We believe it's true. Front to back, cover to cover. God wrote it. He used man. He breathed upon it. It's alive. That's a living book. That's what we believe. We believe it can help you. We, can, we believe that if you allow the Bible to lead and guide your life, it'll do nothing but good for you. Even though it might lead you through troubles and trials and bumps in the road, it can do nothing but help you. Lead you through it. Exactly. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 Paul says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number. And what I believe he means by that is we're not to number ourselves with everyone else. God's people are to be peculiar people. Zealous of good works, it says. We're not to number ourselves with everyone else. We're to separate, sanctify, and we're these peculiar, crazy Christians that believe the Bible. That should be you. A fool for Christ's sake. And the world ought to know that. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, like those that exalt themselves or praise themselves or they approve of themselves. You ever run into someone like that? Like they approve of everything that they do. And that's most everyone. They can do no wrong. And they, they refuse to admit they're wrong when they know that they're wrong. They approve of everything that they do. Paul says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number and compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, that's them, not you, they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing selves among themselves, they are not wise, are they? You see, the common man, he measures himself and compares himself with others. And the Bible says, for we dare not. We dare not. You know we hear it all the time. We hear it in four words. And you've heard it from this pulpit a million times. We hear this in four words. I'm a good person. And to that, I always answer, compared to who? <laughs> compared to who? That is man measuring himself with man. 
it's man, it's the measuring of man's spirituality or man's morality or his, his relationship with God. It, it's a measuring of his righteousness with God, that he's right with God, but he's measuring that against another man. It's like one fallen man measuring himself against another fallen man. It's like the blind leading the blind. Where do they end up? I'm glad you know your Bible. Praise the Lord. I'm right with God. And how do I know that? Look at them. <laughs> That's how they think. God's pleased with me. How do you know? Look at them. How about this? I'm right with God. Look at Jesus. I'm a good person. Compared to who? Why don't you care, compare yourself up against God's measuring stick, which is the man Christ Jesus? This is what Thane did on Thursday with that young man, Kevin. If you were here for Sunday school, that's what he presented to him. He tried to help Kevin understand that you're, you're to measure your righteousness up against the righteousness of Jesus Christ. How do you measure up? You know how you measure up? Just like everyone else on planet Earth, you fall short. See? So man measuring himself with man and comparing himself with man is not wise. So therefore, what is it that man should measure himself with? What is it that God's given us to compare ourselves against? Thank you. So how do you know it's the Bible? Because that's what the Bible teaches. You see, the Bible will tell you about itself. It'll tell you, it'll teach you what it teaches. I don't need to teach it. I just tell you what the Bible says and let the Bible teach you. Ultimately, who's your teacher anyway? Holy Spirit of God, am I right? So, like in Sunday school where I, I uh, searched the scriptures and I showed you there's only one other use of the word persuade, there's only one other use in Paul's writings of the word comparing. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. So I ask the question, if it's not wise for man to compare himself with other man, or man to compare himself against man, what has God given us to compare ourselves against? What has God given man that man can compare himself against? So then he can know for sure whether he's right with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. How about comparing yourself against the things of God? Look at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. How about comparing yourself against what God has given you? And what might that be? Look at the next verse. Which things also we... Does it say speak? Yep. You know what everyone in here speaks? Words. <laughs> Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So you think you're spiritual. So you think you're right with God. That's spiritual, isn't it? To have a right standing with God, isn't that a spiritual thing? So you think God's pleased with you, isn't that a spiritual thing? The Bible says we're to compare our spirituality with that which the Holy Ghost teaches. The last time I checked, well, it used to be. It's not anymore. Now it's, all right, students, take out your laptops or your notebooks. It used to be take out your textbook. The Holy Ghost is our teacher. And if you're going to compare yourself rightly against anything that God has given you, 
It's what the Holy Ghost teacheth with his words. So the Holy Ghost is saying, you want to you find out what you're to be compared to, compare yourself against? Take out the textbook. And there you have it. Okay? So man is taught by the spirit of truth using the words of truth. Words that are recorded, written, and published for you to read. And you can read them every day. Amen. And that's what God has given you. These are the things of God that the Holy Ghost teacheth to compare yourself against. The truth of God's Word. Wouldn't it be a good thing to compare your life against truth? How about compare your life against the wisdom of man? Well, one guy says this, and one guy says this, and another guy says this, and this guy contradicts him, and he contradicts him. You're going to compare your life against a bunch of contradictions? How about just compare your life against the truth of God's Word? Say, I don't like that. I don't like what it says about me. Do you want to be right with God or not? Do you desire to live a life that's pleasing to God or not? You're to compare your spirituality against something else that's spiritual. That thing that the Holy Ghost teacheth. Take out your textbooks. Let me just quote a couple verses here. Proverbs 22, 21, that I might make thee. This is, this is, this is God speaking to you. Proverbs 22, 21, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. If there's one thing in this life I'm sure of, it's that. And I'm sure that I'm to compare my life, my actions, my decisions against that book. And if I do, I'll get it right every time. Write it down, Ecclesiastes 12.10. You can read it later. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. And that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Are you interested in finding the best way to do things? Just going to keep beating your head on the, against the wall. Man's wisdom telling you to do it this way, and this guy's telling you to do it this way, and this doctor's telling you to do it this way, and this psychiatrist is telling you to do it this way, and he says take this pill, and they say, no, that pill doesn't work. This pill works, and go to this counselor, and then he doesn't work, and you go, and you find yourself your whole life just spinning your wheels when you can just open up a book that I'll give you for free and say, God, teach me. I'm sick of it all. I'm tired of it all. None of it works. And then you start applying the certainty of the words of truth to your life and watch it work. I'm trying to help you. The very best you can do in this life is to compare yourself against the Word of God. That is the very best you can do. You can do no better. Let the Bible discern you. Let the Bible define you. Does it matter how man defines you? Who cares what man thinks? Well, you don't know my past, preacher. Forget about it. You don't know how many people I've hurt and how many people I've displeased. Forget about it. How about compare yourself with the Word of God and let the Word of God define you? Are you saved? Are you a child of the living God? Are you saved for all eternity? Are all your sins under the blood? Or do you have a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Hey, nothing beats that. Let the Bible define you. Are you forgiven from all your sins? Yeah, but you don't know what they know about me. Forget about it, man. You can't change their mind. Let God change their mind. How much your actions change their mind? Like, man, they've really changed. What's happened to you? Let me tell you about it. Amen. And God can change their heart. 
trying to help you. You know, the Bible tells you all you need to know about the Bible. You don't need a man to tell you. I'm just here to, I'm just a vessel to tell you what God says. To preach, thus saith the Lord. You ought to read what it says about itself. Yeah. You ought to read what those in the Bible say about the Bible. Wow. They have much to say. The Bible has much to say about itself. He knows God's word is its best argument. <laughs> it's its best. It's, it's either absolute or it's obsolete. Take your pick. Take your pick. It's either absolute or obsolete, and it is a, it's its own best argument. God the Father is the giver of the Holy Scripture. God the Son is the theme of the Holy Scripture. And God the Spirit is the author, the authenticator, and the interpreter of the Holy Scripture. And the Bible is self-interpreting. Just let it stand on its own and believe it. The best thing you can do. Ever dawn on you that the Bible is the only book that Jesus ever quoted? Ever think about that? There are lots of books back then. I promise you, philosophers writing books. It's the only book he ever quoted. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Here's another thing. He never used it or quoted it as a basis for discussion. Like, here's what the Bible said. Let's talk about that. Let's discuss it. <laughs> That's not how Jesus, when he quoted the Bible, it wasn't for a basis of discussion. He quoted it as a deciding factor. He quoted it to point, uh, as to decide the point of an issue. Like, thus saith the Lord, it is written, finished. That's all that matters. That's how he quoted the scripture. As a man that preached with authority. The Bible has much to say about itself. It's its best teacher. It's its best argument. I mean, you can go right down the line. It's the, the Bible defines itself. It, tra it, it translates itself. It interprets itself. It explains itself right down the line. Just let the Bible stand on its own. And you'd be amazed some of the profound things in the Bible that it says about itself. Can I show you a couple things? This is what the Bible says about the Bible. Flip over to Psalm chapter 119. We're just going to turn to a few, chat, few verses and then I'll quote a few. Psalm 119. You know what the Bible says about itself? This is what it teaches about itself. The Bible says and teaches about itself that it is eternal. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> Maybe you didn't hear what I said. The Bible teaches about itself that it is eternal. You ought to all say amen. You say, why, preacher? What, what are you getting so excited about? Tell me one other thing in this world, in this life, that is, that always will be. Give me one thing that is eternal, something you can put your hands upon, something that is, that always will be. Give me one other thing on planet Earth that always will be. Tell me. It's only one thing. You know what the Bible says about itself? That it's everlasting and it's eternal. Psalm 119 and verse 160 Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth how long? Forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That's, a fair, that's pretty profound. Amen. That here you have a book telling you about itself, and it says that it is eternal and forever, and it will last forever, it always will be, and it will, Jesus said, it will never, get the words, pass away. 
You know when someone passes away, what happens? What'd you say? That's one thing. Ah, it's, it stops breathing. It's not alive. We're getting warmer. <gasps> there it is. What did he say? It's not alive. When something passes away, it's no longer alive, which tells me that the Word of God is... A living book. There you go. It's alive forever more. It's as alive as God is. He said, my words will not pass away. And through it, God giveth life forevermore. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. Can I tell you what's in, in the pages of that book? That living word, eternal salvation within its pages. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. I'm just saying it's, it's pretty profound that here you have a book that over and over again declares itself and teaches that it, the book is teaching you about the book and the book teaches that it is everlasting and eternal and will never fade away and it is alive and it will never pass away and through the words of that book a lost sinner can have ever the life of God. Isn't that amazing? It, it didn't amaze you that a man can, can go like this and open this book or a woman or a child and then believe the words of that book and in a moment his eternal destination changed altered settled how long Forever. for as long as that book will be amen, amen. In a, it, like in a moment, he can, re, he can sit down and open up this physical book right here and read these words that are alive, they're living. And in a moment, he can be transformed and translated. He was once unknown to God, and now he's known to God. He was once alienated from the promise of God. Now he's a joint heir with Christ. He was once a child of the devil. Now he's a child of God. By opening up this eternal book that will last forever, and it's living and it's breathing, it breathes life. It's eternal. You know, I, I don't know for sure, and we'll have to wait till we get there. Because I don't know how, how we're going to look there. But this might be the only recognizable thing there in the kingdom of God. The only recognizable thing that you recognized here and, and knew here that you know there. The words that I speak unto you, their spirit and their life. Mm -hmm. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. It always will be. Mm. That's what the Bible says about itself. Mm. It's eternal. You want one more? This is a good one. Yeah. <laughs> it's eternal. Yeah. It's edible. I don't know of another book that says, eat me. <laughs> eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. Is it edible? Yep. Remember Tony McLaughlin? He was here many years ago, Big Tony. And he found him one of those real miniature Bibles, and he actually ate it. What? Didn't do anything for him. <laughs>
the flesh profited nothing, like getting the... It's edible. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Jesus said it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. There's like a million brilliant quotes. If you want to look at quotes about the Bible, there's like millions of very brilliant kind of like catchy quotes like that just kind of spark you like whoa open up your eyes and I was reading down through them and I found a few that I think apply the Bible is meant to be bread for daily use not cake for special occasions how you like that one not a good one not a good one Come on, child of God. Bread's for your daily good. Quit dusting off that cake, pulling it out every once in a while. How about this one? Those who only sample the Bible never acquire a taste for it. God feeds the birds. Does he feed the birds? but he doesn't throw food into their nests. They got to go get it. You got it? You know what Job said? You should know this verse. Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Reading the Bible without meditating upon it is like eating without chewing. That's a good one, isn't it? I got my Bible chart and I got to read through my Bible. Why don't you stop? You'd be better off just stopping it with one verse and actually yep. meditating upon what it's saying to you personally. He said, Job said, I've seen the words of his mouth more than, more than my necessary food. The Bible is spiritually what food is naturally. But Job says, I've esteemed it more than my necessary food. You know what food is, don't you? What's food? What is food? Say good. <laughs> Yummy, right? Food is, ne- is a necessity for survival. That's what food is. Is it a necessity for survival? Well, quit eating for a, a year. That's what food is. It's a necessity for survival. Child of God, if you're going to survive in this world, you're going to need to consume much Bible daily. You better be in that book. It's no wonder that the Bible's like, and what's it likened to? Bread? Meat, milk, honey, and the all-essential water. Four days without water? Don't try it. Don't try this at home, kids, okay? Four days without water or a little longer is certain death. And the reason I said that is because Job esteemed the Word of God more than his necessary food more than the life-giving force of water he said God's word is more important than water and water is pretty important isn't it Job's estimation of God's word was that of a necessity to survive a necessity to survive Job's like I cannot live without it there's no way I cannot. Food contains nourishing properties, doesn't it? Tastes good. good. Nourishing properties for your eternal being and properties of healing also. Healing properties. Did you know that this Bible can heal you? 
Has it healed you spiritually? The Bible says by his stripes you're healed. Has it spilled? You know, the, the spiritual disease that affected everyone is sin. Yes. Did that heal you? Yeah. You believe that it'll heal you? Yeah. It has, hasn't it? Yeah. But you know, you believe that it'll also help you in this life. Yes. Hey, it can bring healing in. Has that ever healed a marriage? Yeah. Come on now. Has that ever got a, a drunkard off of alcohol? Yep. By the millions. That ever got a drug addict off of drugs? Of course it has. Believe it. It effectually worketh. Psalm 107, 20. He sent his word and healed them. How about that? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. That'll help you right now in this life. Read a story about Shea Walters. Here's a girl who has your last name, Shea Walters. She tells the story of her son. She gives us a short, a short story of her son through the first six or seven years of his life. And this is the story that she tells about her son. She says this at about a year old, I overdosed with him in my bed. And she said, well, it was just a mattress on my living room floor. At two, he had come to visit me in jail. And he beat against the glass, screaming and crying for his mommy. After that, he started biting his nails. At three, he witnessed me get hit in the head with a brick and my head split open. He rode with me in the ambulance. It scared him real bad. At four, he was in a car wreck with me, one of my many DUIs. At five, my mother had to raise him most of the time. I barely even came home. At six, I lost custody and I went to prison. Here's the story of her son the first six years. And then in October 2015, she was arrested on nine felony drug charges and facing 22 years. And it was there in prison that the Word of God came to her. Amen. And Jesus found her. And completely helpless and hopeless without any hope in the world, she called upon him. Amen. You know what she said? She was delivered freedom from drug addiction instantaneous. And this is many years past that. She said, I've never touched a drug since then. Amen. Praise God. Like that. Glory to God. I'm just saying the word of God can heal you. Now she has a ministry to drug addicts and to... It was there in prison that the Word of God came to her and she cried out for mercy and she found Jesus and she was healed. This is what she says about her son now. He's 12 today. He lives with me. He attends a private Christian school. He's on the honor roll. He gets prayed with every single night. Give me another book that can do that. He says, I'm there to wake him. She said, I'm there to wake him up every morning for school. I celebrate all his accomplishments and he celebrates every sober birthday with me. I tell him how much I love him every day. He is so kind to the broken. Because we were once broken. Man, this duct tape ain't got nothing on the Bible, people. It's like super glue. Like you wouldn't believe. It can mend what's been broken. It can fix what's been broken. It can heal. Yes, it can. 
because within its pages you'll find eternal life. Life eternal. It lives forever. And if you consume it, it will heal you. I promise. It's eternal. It's edible. And it's exalted. Did, did you know that the Bible exalts itself? You know, Jesus is the only one. You know, he's called the Word of God. He's the only one that can rightly exalt himself. He did, too. He did it over and over again in his ministry. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said, destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it up. I'll bring myself out of the tomb. Isn't that? Sounds kind of boastful, doesn't it? Sounds kind of proud, doesn't it? Well, he's the only one that can rightly be proud and boastful because he's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and there's no name higher than his. But the Bible exalts itself. It puts itself on a pedestal. You know how high it exalts itself? You've probably heard me quote this verse before. If you haven't, you need to know this verse, Psalm 138 and verse 2. What's it say? Psalm 138 and verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. What? The word above the name of the Lord? I thought the name of the, it's the name above every name. Is Jesus the name above every name? It's, his name is above every name. In that verse said he's magnified his word above his name. Is Jesus the name above every name? Yes. How do you know? <laughs> you see what I'm getting at. Take the Bible out of the equation. How do you know that Jesus' name is above every You don't know. Two weeks ago, I like talking about our what goes on out there knocking doors. Pray for us. Keep us in your prayers. We're out there trying to do the Lord's work and spread the gospel, preach the, preach the gospel, pass out tracts, just trying to reach some folks here in Sioux City. Say, no one else wants to do it. I'll do it. <laughs> I don't care. I'll do it. The more I do it, more I love it. Yes. Amen. Two weeks ago, me and Thane were out knocking when we knocked on the door of a Catholic man. You say, how do, I know, how do we know he's a Catholic man? Well, on his porch was a statue of Mary. And that's how I knew. <laughs> but an interesting thing about this statue, it had no hands. Either some kid knocked him off, or maybe it was an old statue, maybe just, you know, from age, they just fell off. You know what I thought? This is what came to my mind. She can't help nobody. In Psalm 119, it says, Let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. Do you know what can help you? The Word of God. She had no hands. They'd been knocked off. And to me, that picture is that Mary can't help you a bit. She can't help you. She's a sinner just like you were. She needed a Savior. Here's the sad thing. So here she is with no hands. You know what was under her feet? You know what she was standing on? Little baby Jesus. Yeah. You can find statues like that all the time. It's big Mary and little Jesus. And Jesus was under her feet. I'll go show it to you. Are we going to go see it? Probably fine. She's standing on the head of Jesus. There's only one thing that Jesus magnifies above his head. Say, so how do I know? You know, they put an inscription above his head. It is written. The king of the Jews. You know, when he died on the cross, scripture <laughs> was right there. Thou hast magnified that word above all thy name. That's the only thing that Jesus will lift up above his head because it's by the word of God that we know him. You know nothing about him without that. And it's eternal and it's edible and it exalts itself and it can rightly do so.
because it's the Word of God. And to me, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. You know, the Bible is referred to in many different ways. We speak of it as God's Word, the good book, the holy scriptures, the sword of the Spirit. It's known as the book of books, the living word. Some simply call it the book. I like calling it the book. When I say, you know, if I'm on my deathbed and say, bring me the book, my goodness, don't bring me Shakespeare. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> bring me the book. stands alone. It towers above all the others, doesn't it? Some people have referred to it as God's miracle book. Because it is. It's a miracle for a number of reasons. It's miraculous in its origin coming to us by divine inspiration. It is miraculous in its durability, outlasting the opposition, the critics, and surviving the countless attempts by its enemies to exterminate it. Burn that book. How are you going to get rid of something that's forever? <laughs> that God promised to preserve forever. Have at it. That's like jumping out of a plane without a parachute. You think it's going to work. Try it. You can, you can, right? You can skydive one time without a parachute. You can do it. Go for it. <laughs> it's miraculous in its durability. It's miraculous in its results. How about its results? Transforming the lives of those who read and believe it. It's miraculous in its harmony. Agreeing in all parts, even though written over a period of 1,600 years by about 40 different authors. And yet it all came together into one book, and it's harmonious from front to back. The Quran. <laughs> Give me a break. It's a joke compared to that. It's miraculous in its message, telling of many, many, many occasions when God supernaturally intervened in the affairs of men over and over again. And it's miraculous in its preservation, maintaining its accuracy and reliability down through the centuries from the very beginning. It tells you how it all began. It tells you what happened. It tells you what's happening right now. And it tells you what's going to happen and how it all will end. You see, the best definer of the Bible is the Bible. It explains itself. Leave it alone. That's what I tell these Bible critics, these Bible correctors that sit in authority over the Word of God. Well, the best rendering would be in the Greek, you know, this is faulty here in the English, and in the Greek it should be, who do you think you are? Leave it alone. Let it stand alone. And if you believe it, it'll work every single time. I don't know of anything else in this world that works every single time. That does. Amen? All right. That's all I got for you. If you were here for Sunday school, you heard some things. I'm trying to help you. Help you understand what's going on in this world because the world's gone mad. But we're not to fear. We're to be of a sound mind. Stable, established. Because there's someone out there that needs you. 
They're pulling their hair out. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. There's, and you hold the answers. The certainty of the words of truth. You certain about that? I'm so certain, I'm certain. I know one person that's certain about the Word of God. God. <laughs> He's very certain. <laughs> Amen. It's eternal. It's edible. You won't survive alone without that book, spiritually speaking. It's exalted. It's extraordinary is what it is. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. All right, let's close in prayer. Thank you for coming. You keep praying for our little church here. We're just going to keep doing it God's way. Forward, 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 only one direction. Not looking back. Amen? All right, Corey, you close us in prayer.